Welcome to the Compact Podcast. Today I'm joined by Saurabh Amari and Nina Power. We'll discuss Saurabh's uh, newly launched Wednesday newsletter available exclusively to subscribers to the Compact Substack. You can subscribe for just $5 a month or $50 a year. In this week's installment, which we're going to tease just for you, our podcast listeners, Saurabh attends a recent Gone with the Wind party in New York, bringing together the fashion worlds and the online Twitter anons. Then we'll talk a bit about inflation, which uh, seems to be coming back. Saraba, were you watching the Super Bowl on Sunday or uh, where were you exactly? Uh, tell us a bit about your uh, re- really fascinating report on your uh, Substack. Yeah. So first of all, fans, subscribers of Compact, please turn over to compactmag.substack.com where you'll find we're now present on that all-important platform. Specifically, we're offering two newsletters. Uh, On Wednesdays, for paid subscribers, I'll be writing The New Center. It's kind of me being off the cuff, more loose than I am in my kind of buttoned-up, polished columns. So that makes it kind of fun. We're kind of pitching it as, you know, me at my kind of in my cigarette smoking martini gulping moments, which my colleagues and friends know uh, it's a lot more off the cuff than you would get in like when I write a column for Compact or the New Statesman or some such. So please go on over there. And the first one is pretty spicy, I, I should say. I was, as Matthew asked, I was not watching the Super Bowl. It's The Super Bowl is one of a very few sporting events that I watch, usually uh, with like beer and wings. And this time I did not because I went to a costume ball slash uh, salon organized by the fashion designer Elena Velez, who is both a very kind of mainstream celebrated New York Times and Vogue profiled designer, but also has one foot in the world of the weird racial right. So like Bronze Age pervert, zero HP Lovecraft, Lomez. She knows all of them. She's friendly with them. And this event sort of brought the two of them together, the two camps together, uh, you know, in the sense that it was a, it wasn't, it, it, it's pegged to fashion week, but it's not a fashion show because as she told me, she's run out of money to do a regular fashion show. So she's trying to do more of a discussion salon and it's centered around Gone, Gone with the Wind, which is kind of provocative in our times. And her, the idea is that you know, this is a good balance between the two worlds that she tries to straddle. Because uh, as she told me in the interview, you know, she feels like if she goes all the way with the racial right, you know, with their like weird chat rooms and stuff, she said, it'll. I'll, I don't want to end up in a clan meeting. But short of that, I guess she organized a Gone with the Winds themed discussion featuring Anakachian of Red Scare and a podcaster named Perfume Nationalist. Uh, Jack, uh, his name is Jack Mason, whose work connects historically significant fragrances to historically significant you know, cultural artifacts like movies and books. So that was that was the basics of what I was doing instead of being at the Super Bowl. The, the, the dress code was rustic Americana black tie, which I had to really think about what that meant, but not really because I only have one black tie outfit, which is my wedding tux. And I squeezed myself into that wedding tux. And, you know, you have those moments where you're doing stuff like that. And you have you make these very childish, teenage like resolutions where I was like, I am never eating again, ever until I can fit into this tux. But I, anyway, I managed. Uh, and then I showed up and I was kind of relieved because all the other guys were you know, just sorry, like a lot goofier because whatever 19th century black tie is, is very hard to achieve these days. So a lot of them kind of look like magicians or like steampunk cosplayers. Like they were wearing those tails that are purple with like silver embroidery in them. Not, nothing that Rhett Butler from Gone with the Winds would ever be caught dead in. Anyway, that's maybe that's an, I'll stop there. But, you know, I hope you'll, you guys will check out the, the Substack because it's pretty exciting. When Matthew and I conceived it, he basically said, this will not be edited. And I, you know, that's very much against my and my and Matthew's philosophy in other contexts. Compact pieces are typically edited three or four times or if not more, but we need an off the cuff outlet and this is it. And so without, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the whole thing. So maybe we should just stop there. Go to compactmag.substack.com. You'll get the, you know, that the first paid newsletter of, of, of mine. And then if you sign up for the free version you, on Fridays, you will get Nina's and I'll let her tell you more about that.
So there is a lot of on the scene reporting, some funny moments in there, especially an exchange you have with another writer, uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams at The Atlantic, which I won't quote here. And I'll just reserve that for your uh, the subscribers to the Substack. But you know, stepping back from it, it's interesting that there's been this embrace of the novel Gone with the Wind, which does have kind of edgy racial vibes, right? It's especially in the celebrated film version is received as a kind of nostalgic celebration of uh, the old South, you know, where everybody got along so well and, um, you know, the the old pieties prevailed before Yankee perfidy intervened or whatever. But if you read the novel, it's notable for having also a very progressive character and for having its own polemic against nostalgia. You know, Scarlett O'Hara is this character who thrives more in the bustling rail hub, which was kind of created from nothing uh, in, in this period. It wasn't a kind of old town like uh, Charleston, South Carolina. She really thrives in that context where she hustles and makes deals, including with the Yankees. And of course, being o, you know, her name being o, O'Hara, she uh, stands a little bit apart from the kind of planter aristocracy more generally because she's Irish. And, you know, her family's famous home, Tara, is named for the ancient seat of the kings of Ireland. So it, it's, it does seem like the perfect cultural product for a kind of online scene that's both interested in maybe like an online and IRL scene that's interested in poking at pro- you know, current progressive racial pieties and, and maybe maybe going far beyond that and actually question, questioning some really kind of broadly shared beliefs in the equality of all people. It's kind of edgy vibes are helpful in that way, but also being a, just insofar as it's about a kind of ethnically marked urban outsider hustler, you know, Scarlet is scorned by her society and learns to scorn it in turn. Really, I think probably fits with the feelings of a lot of people today who are alienated, maybe not old stock Americans, but nonetheless disenchanted with the current order. Yeah, just to note um, that the Washington Post has also just uh, published a piece about this fashion show that Saurabh also went to. um, And of course, they describe it as a problematic and pointedly hostile and uh, and so on. So it might be interesting if people have a subscription not only to our new compact substack, but also to the Washington Post to compare and contrast Saurabh's impression with the impression of the Washington Post fashion writer, whose name is Rachel Tashtian. Um, and Rachel Tashtian finds the founder show, um, I suppose she, she, she does that move where she says that it's kind of boring to be edgy you know this is the ultimate move that there's something kind of passe and 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 boring about it but frankly it looks kind of fun I think I I would have enjoyed dressing up in rustic whatever it was Americana costume I actually wrote about Gone with the Wind the censorship of the uh, streaming service I actually wrote a whole article about this a while ago when they started pulling the film and they reintroduced it with a new introduction that was supposed to kind of frame the problematic elements of the of the film, but it's uh, it's it's very interesting test case for you know what we think are the limits of uh, any contemporary liberal freedom of expression and so on, and it's very obvious that Gone with the Wind is touches some nerves. Yeah, and I want to just get at a, an issue that you've raised in your in your piece, Sarab. This isn't a part I believe that's you know can be read before the paywall hits, so we're not we're not betraying our loyal subscribers. But you mentioned that Elena Velez, the fashion designer behind this, who has you know genuine mainstream recognition, she feels a certain attraction to this world, but also maybe a latent revulsion that at some point could be activated. What 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 explains that kind of seeming ambivalence, or what's going on there? Yeah, I, I found Elena herself, and I spent an, an, a, more than an hour at her studio in Greenpoint uh, interviewing her weeks ahead, and she was already conceiving of this event. And I, you know, I found her, first of all, extremely sophisticated, extremely aware of where she stands in the culture. You know, she's like, on the one hand, the reason I, you know, if I were a blonde white woman, I wouldn't get any of this sort of access and entree that I've received. It's because I'm from the Midwest. I'm half Hispanic. I'm, or I'm Hispanic. My, you know, I have, I'm a mom, you know, the, the mainstream culture allows me to occupy a certain space. I find that space quite stifling because of the sort of the way she described it as a kind of prissy, almost Victorian culture, you know, transgression has stopped ideals of femininity that she celebrates, which are, as she put it, bodily, aggressive sexually women who are sexually aggressive 
are not welcome. You know, that there was just these victimhood narratives and so on. And so as compared to that, you know, the way she put it to me was that she finds a kind of freedom, and here I'm par paraphrasing, in like the world of BAP and Zero HP Lovecraft and so on. But at the same time, she wish she wishes there was some other other space. If I were to critique her, there's a flaw, which I, you don't have to go all the way to like that stuff to to find greater cultural freedom. Um, I talked about, you know, directors in Hollywood who can inject quite subversive messages. And she's like, well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm like half mainstream, half edgy. But she certainly, you know, recognizes that there is a kind of terminus, a logical terminus to this kind of stuff, which, as she put it to me, is a clan meeting. And so I think it'll be interesting to watch how she how she navigates all that. I think what this event tried to be is a kind of synthesis of the respectable and the subterranean. I, I don't know. The race stuff was always held at bay and talk, talked about coyly. But then you had people in the room who are Anans who are very famous for saying, you know, for like casually saying pretty racist stuff, let's be honest. And it's themed around Gone with the Wind. So I guess the tension that will play out in an interesting way for me watching it from afar is what racial settlement are these people advancing? Like, what what is it that they want? I mean, certainly... As you said, the message of Gone with the Wind is not nostalgia for like the South's quote unquote civilization. It's a, you know, it's one of a kind of ruthless adaptation to the new and a, a disdain for nostalgia. I mean, that is that is the core of Scarlett O'Hara. So that's not what they want. So what is it that they want? And I won't I explore this more in depth in the piece. I won't say more because I want everyone to subscribe to Compact's new uh, newsletter, which you can find at compactmag.substack.com. So I only keep saying it because on Twitter, as you know, references to Substack and links to Substack are heavily uh, derogated by the algorithm because obviously Elon wants you to not go to Substack. So please, if you like that platform, which I think is valuable and you like Compact, please support us there. Really interesting question where, where this is going um, in terms of the novel's own politics. I think there's a moment in Gone with the Wind that maybe kind of helps bring into focus what one of the kind of tensions in this scene or this world. I mean, Scarlett O'Hara at one point in the novel uh, uses the N word uh, for the first time. And this is a, a word that her mother would have been uh, shocked to hear her employ. You know, not, not a word to be used by kind of good. Uh, respectable people, you know, that these online spaces that encourage uh, shocking statements and uh, extreme provocation, the, these are really sort of uh, subversive spaces that work against hierarchies of value and notions of respectability that would be embedded even in something like slave society, right? So the, the, it's really kind of, it's just odd. Like if you, if you're sort of, a, I guess I would say like, if you're attracted to, you know, glamour and seeming refinement of this old lost world, I mean, that, that kind of glamour, however, uh, superficial and finally false was, you know, is in tension with the kind of edgy, provocative, say whatever you want, let it all hang out ethos that these people also seem to want to cultivate. So it's kind of, there's kind of a question like, do they want, what do you want? Do you want civilization and refinement or just an ability to say anything, no matter how offensive? I think there is a, a little tension there that's present, even just abstracting from the very important kind of moral questions involved in all this. Coming, uh, out of the 19th century and into the 21st, we just uh, this week got a new consumer price index, which was up 3.1% from a year earlier. Economists had uh, predicted a more modest increase in the consumer price index. They expected it to only be 2.9. Do those uh, 0.2 points seem to matter? Well, uh, yes, it shows that... Uh, Inflation, which many economists said would be transitory, is still with us. Um, the consumer price index excludes uh, gas and food, where you probably see you know, bigger increases. You know, it's just another another troubling sign, obviously, for our, our economy. It's also a worrisome sign for Joe Biden's uh, re-election. We can talk about things like wokeness or defending democracy or abortion. All of these issues have you know, their, their own importance. But for a lot of voters, the economy is going to be paramount. It looks like inflation has not yet gone away. Yeah, just to say in the UK, the latest stats on inflation have uh, remained unchanged at 4%. Uh, so it's holding steady uh, uh, unexpectedly. 
Um, but energy bills are going up. And uh, it's interesting, I think this p- potential disconnect really between, let's say, the, the economic side of things and how people actually feel about their own lives and how they interpret price and cost and cost of living, because there seems to be sort of increasing mismatch. And at the same time, there's always this sort of slippage between things like consumer confidence and confidence in the economy as if our emotions are supposed to somehow map on to the uh, the reality of the market which indeed they they do to some degree you know when we talk about depression and uh, you know optimism these are both human well they are they're only human feelings but they're they're kind of you know reified uh, in market terms so yes we're a sort of holding steady in the UK uh, of slightly better than predicted news on the cost of living so Rob, you mentioned you know, cigarette smoking and martini sipping earlier, maybe, or maybe it wasn't sipping. I can't remember how you phrased it. Was it, it was scrolling? gulping. I'm not, not sure. It was gulping. Gulp, gulping. Wow. Gulping. Slonking. Yeah. Well, uh, so especially with slonking, especially <laughs> when you're slonking a, you know, raw raw vodka or whatever. Have, have you seen some price increases there on your uh, whatever you've got, uh, Cowboy Killers and uh, Tito's vodka? Oh my goodness! Oh, sorry, it took me a second to process what you were saying because it's such a traumatic thought. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. That, that I, I, I already smoked expensive cigarettes and there's no really good explanation for why I smoke Dunhill Internationals, which is comes in a square box and uh, it divides into two halves. In fact, the, the design, the, the deliciousness of a, of, a, of a classic English design of, of Dunhill cigarettes is why I'm a smoker. Why? Because when I was 17 years old, this friend of mine in Utah, right? Remember, I, I grew up in rural Utah. He came back from a trip abroad and brought a box of Dunhill cigarettes, uh, a carton. And he gave each of his friends, including me, one of these. And I just absolutely fell in love with the way that you open it, but it's not the entire pack that's available. It's like one half first. And you that's where the pull the sort of foil off. Kids, if you if you're tempted by this, try it. It's really, no, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't do it. It's a horrible <laughs> addiction. But, 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 you know, you just, it's so stylish and they're like slightly longer, but not feminine long cigarettes. Anyway, a year ago, they were 18 bucks in New York City and now they're, they're 20 and I can easily see, they, I mean, they, see, they seem to go up a dollar in price every, every six months. And, and martinis, this one I can, I can draw from your uh, firsthand knowledge as well, Matthew. We're now at 20 bucks per martini as opposed to like, what, 17, 18, just a year ago? I don't really smoke anymore, but when I did, I would occasionally find a bodega where uh, you could get kind of illegal sort of untaxed cigarettes. I suppose that's a little harder to find uh, Dunhills that have been you know smuggled up from Virginia, say, and uh, you don't have to pay any tax on, huh? So a little, little, dodge to, a little hard to dodge the uh, tax man on those. Um, is there any work around? Do you have like Nina smuggle you cigarettes from the UK or anything? I could do that. I mean, I sort of don't, I don't wish to encourage vice, but. <laughs> now nah, there's a problem with the Nina solution or indeed the, yeah, the Europe solution. And that is the fact that in Europe, the design of cigarettes is so hideous. So if you care about the design of a, of a Dunhill box and here, I, I realize we're not a, this is a, voice only podcast but look how elegant that is you know i'm showing it to my colleagues here in in the uk it would be this but it would be like you know a picture of a hideous lung with like pustules and and you know disgusting effects associated with the tar oh yes this um, is true so they have this the, the, kind of this yeah yeah horror show grotesquery which is supposed to nudge you into but actually people just they they actually have designed their own stickers to kind of make humorous comment on these you know diseased lungs and uh, it's actually become obviously a a thing of thing of joy and celebration (laughs) yeah i mean when i was in um junior high in uh rural nebraska you know we had our health class and there was the very important sex education component. And, you know, a doctor came in from the town clinic and did a slideshow on the overhead projector, just showing like the most hardcore display anyone could ever see of just like shot after shot, close-ups of genitalia with like advanced stages of various uh, venereal diseases and horrible growths and pustules and sores and everything. And maybe if the kind of culture wars of the 90s and later had gone a little differently, we would have 
that kind of cigarette style packaging you're talking about uh, in Europe on you know, like boxes of condoms and birth control or whatever. Like you can still buy this, but uh, or may- or maybe not on condoms because I could you know the prophylactic could be seen as helping prevent. But you know any anything associated with potentially dangerous act of sex. You know, could have this kind of horror show packaging. So yeah, I guess I guess that's a cross cross partisan instinct. Is you know, this will kill you. It will make you ugly. It will make you hideous. I mean, the uh, can we go back to inflation? Should we go back to inflation? Um, I wonder what our friend Malcolm would say in terms of the uh, <laughs> contribution of the Red Sea crisis to the lack of overall pr- price stability. I'm not, I'm genuinely not sure, but it's just like one factor among many. I mean, there's been like supply bottlenecks for a long time since the pandemic, which I think have not been fully, you know, kind of loosened up. There is the Red Sea crisis. There is some wage price inflation, to be sure. So I don't know. I mean, this is all overall, it feels like a very difficult time for President Biden's reelection prospects. Any one thing would be okay, but it's all combined. The fact that the special counsel report just sounded so bad. You know, the idea that he can't be held culpable because he's just a genial, basically semi-senile old man. That read very badly and shocked a lot of people. And then he held a press conference to try to, to clear up that impression and turned up, you know, mistaking President Sisi of Egypt with AMLO's, uh, with Mexico's AMLO, you know, and, my, and and then the the border crisis, you know, you add the fact that every week there seems to be like a piece of news that ri- roils not just, you know, people like Matthew or me, but people more like blue city mayors and African-Americans in places like Boston, whose, you know, rec centers have been um, taken over to turn and in, turn into migrant shelters and so on. You add up all that together and things are looking really tough for President Biden. One thing I'll add, Sarab, kind of connects the migrant crisis and the broader issue of inflation is that you know, the more people are coming into this country, the more expensive housing is going to get. I mean, this is something that can't be said in kind of progressive or left circles. You know, they're sort of these kind of de fide um, kind of uh, catechetical statements they make. It's like, we don't have... Uh, too many people, we have a housing shortage. Yes, we need more housing for sure. Um, and you know, I'm not trying to adopt a kind of Malthusian uh, politics of, oh, well, uh, you know, we, we can never expand, we can never build more. But when you're constantly bringing in people, it's going to put pressure on housing. Uh, so that's just one more element of this crisis. And uh, it's, just, it's a point of frustration uh, for me that uh, for whatever reason, uh, this is regarded as a taboo topic on half of the political spectrum. So with that, uh, thanks to our rustically attired Sarab Amari and uh, to Nina Power, our cigarette uh, smuggling Brent, and thanks to you listeners. Until next week, join us at compactmag.com and compactmag.substack.com to read Sarab's latest report and to catch uh, notes from Nina, her personal summary that we can use on Friday.